do you build an amazing flooring system in a sprinter van without sacrificing height or heat? Hello party people, I'm Will Pemble and this is Sprinter Saturday. Welcome to my brand new 2020 Mercedes-Benz 170 inch wheelbase Sprinter 3500 series van. As you can see, it's mostly empty. There's almost nothing inside here. Um, we need to change all of that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start from the floor and we're gonna work our way up and out. And when this project is done, I promise you this is gonna be one of the most amazing Sprinter vans anybody has ever seen. I am seriously committed to this project and I would love to have your help. So please subscribe to the channel. Please comment and ask questions and make suggestions and tell me how I could do it better. You know I'm always open to your feedback. Many hands make light work. 70,000 heads are better than one. All of those things. So for today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the factory cargo floor out, which is gonna involve a little bit of tool work and a lot of just like muscle, um, which is funny, you know, if you're me. And we're gonna get that done and we're gonna start laying out the bits and pieces and components that make up an amazingly effective, well insulated, but not too tall floor. Because one of the things in a sprinter van, all you got is this, all I've got is like, I don't know, two and a half inches to play with before things get uh, a little tight. I like to be able to stand up. That's one of the things about a high roof van is you can stand up in it, that's fantastic. I don't wanna build to where I have to crouch just a little bit. So a quarter inch here, a half an inch there, three quarters of an inch somewhere else, all of those things make a huge difference when we're talking about height. The other thing that we wanna talk about is heat. How do we insulate this van in a way that keeps everything breathing, it keeps everything dry where it should be, it allows for the van to flex and move as you drive it around, right? I've heard, I've heard uh, camper vans described as rolling earthquakes and having spent a fair bit of time in San Francisco, Francisco, I can tell you an earthquake is a serious and amazing thing. So we want to build this thing so that it can survive its rolling earthquake and it all starts with the floor. That is literally the rock on which our house will be built. So let's get started right now. To do this project you're going to need at least these things. First you're going to need a caulking gun of some kind. Doesn't have to be a fancy electric one. Any old caulking gun will do the trick. And then you will need some adhesive that you like. I choose Liquid nails fuse it for all surfaces. It's easy, it's simple, it gets the job done. You're also gonna need a drill or screwdriver of some kind, and you're gonna need a 5 16 hex nut fitting and a Torx T20 fitting so that you can drive in the different kinds of screws that we're gonna use. And these are 5 16 by 5 8 self-drilling screws that we use to put in little L brackets, not shown here. And then these are one inch by number 10 self-drilling screws and they have a T20 Torx bit on top. I try to use Torx wherever I can because it's a Sprinter van and Sprinter loves Torx. You're also gonna need Loctite. Every screw, every nut, every bolt, every time Loctite. Don't hope for the best, use Loctite. You're also gonna need a hacksaw and or an aluminum cutting chop saw, an electric saw. You'll need at least a razor blade knife, maybe two razor blade knives, a tape measure, a speed square is always a nice thing to have. A bigger square is absolutely necessary to make sure that the beams you're putting in, the joists you're putting in are square. You're also gonna need this awesome three quarter inch square aluminum tubing with one eighth inch walls. And you're gonna need quite a bit of that three quarter inch thick polystyrene foam insulation and some half inch plywood. I used maple just because it's hardwood plywood, so half inch plywood. And then here is our mass loaded vinyl. It's an eighth of an inch thick and it's very, very heavy, kills sound, kills heat, does lots of awesome things. And then this little thing is just a kooky little tool I use to Mark, once I put the joists in, if I put the joists in the van and I put them against the wall, I'll then use a Sharpie just to trace up the sides of the wall so that I know where all my joists are once I put the floor down. I'll know where to find those things and then I can use a plumb line to mark places for screws and so on. 
So that is most of the stuff that you're gonna need. This is not a completely exhaustive list, but if you start with all of these things, you will greatly reduce the number of trips to Lowe's that you're gonna have to make during this project. The first step in putting in a new floor is taking out the old floor. Not a super big deal, not particularly hard, but we do wanna be careful and thoughtful and keep a couple of things in mind. One of the things we wanna keep in mind is that Mercedes uses torques a lot. So where you might see a hex bolt or a Phillips head screw in some other kind of vehicle or some other place, what you're gonna find in Mercedes pretty much across the board are Torx screws. And so what one of the things that you're gonna need is a really good set of Torx for your socket set. You're gonna need a bunch of Torx drivers. You're gonna need a bunch of Torx bits for your impact driver, your drill, all of those things. And so I love to pick up new tools whenever I can. I have done so for this project, you can be sure. Now I love Torx because that's the hardware that I use to build all the roller coasters. When you have a Torx bit, T25 is my personal favorite. When you have a Torx bit in a deck screw or something like that, and you put that Torx bit into the screw, it just stays and it doesn't slip and it doesn't strip. It's really, really fantastic. And so I think that's why the nice folks at Mercedes use these because they're just well engineered things, right? What's the, uh, you know, what's the joke? How many, uh, how many Mercedes engineers does it take to change a light bulb? None if it's engineered properly. Right? So anyway, that's one of my jokes. The first step in the process is we've got to take out all of this hardware that is strewn around the vehicle and we want to do it carefully and gently and keep all the bits and pieces so that we have them if we need them later. We're going to start at the very beginning, which in this case is the very end, the back of the van. And I'm going to start by removing this piece of molding and then all the D-rings and very important, I'm going to keep them all in the same place. Everything is going to go in this box. It's going to get a label. It's going to get a date. We're going to know where it came from so I can go find it later when it's time to find it later. So here we go. Some folks would bust out their impact driver or a drill and put a Torx bit on the end of their drill and start to really, really just drill these things out of here really, really fast. And they would certainly come out really fast, but I'm not super familiar with this vehicle. I'm not super familiar with this hardware, these tools, any of this. So what I wanna do is I wanna go slow. If I have a power drill and I start to take something out, I'm not gonna be able to feel it the way I can feel it if I use my hands. And so I'm going slowly and I'm going carefully so that I can learn and get familiar with and get to know and get the feel of this project and this, this material. Make sure you have a little bin to put your screws in. Look, here's the first taken apart piece of the van. Fancy. try to use the smallest tools possible so that I don't have huge amounts of leverage because I don't want to strip and ruin anything. So here's our D-ring component. See that? See that Loctite? That little blue stuff right there. Put all those pieces in there. All right, now let's go get all the rest of them. So here we are, new shirt, new day. I finished up by taking all of the D-rings and spacers and clips. There's all sorts of kooky stuff if you want to look inside here. Here's a D-ring, a spacer. Each of those D-rings and spacers had some different sized spacer in between the hardware and the floor because the floor is not 100% reliable from one end to the other. This one came from all the way up in the front, but all of these different spacers and things. I don't think I need any of this, although I'm keeping all of it because, you know, sometimes things come in handy. For my next trick, what I want to do is cut a new piece of floor out of some maple plywood that I've got. And one thing that, not particularly controversial, but I've seen a lot of folks go really, really meticulous around the angles and the curve of where the subfloor meets the side of the van, um, to me, I don't know that apart from making sure the thing is really well supported, I don't know that there's a whole lot of future in making it any more 
precise or fitted than the factory has done here. We're doing four foot lengths of plywood and so our first seam is going to go right here in between the wheel wells and that might work out fine for some reasons which will become evident in future episodes. But for the first four feet of this thing, I think this factory floor is going to be a near perfect template. And the only places that I might want to tweak it a little bit is right up here. But even still, I think that's going to be perfectly fine because whatever walls we put on the side are going to come up and cover this thing. And I don't mind the idea of there being a little bit of play between the sides of the van and the floor. Because remember, this whole van is going to twist and turn and creak and shake as we drive it. So if everything is like super tightly fitted, like perfect cabinetry, I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. We might want to give it a little bit of a, a little bit of breathing room here and there. So I'm going to pull this piece of flooring out and we're going to use that for our template when we cut the maple plywood subfloor. It's Velcroed. I don't want to damage that aluminum strip up there when I peel this up. So this is what the underneath side of our subfloor looks like. Look, I got myself a brand new piece of Velcro there. Yay. A little bit of foam for, I guess, sound deadening and rattle stopping, but not the level of subfloor that we would want for our beautiful RV. My old Velcro is amazing stuff, huh? That's the blank floor of the van. We've got the cargo floor removed from the van and now we've got a completely blank Sprinter van, which I think is fantastic news. Um, you'll see I've taped off a couple of places where I think I might want to put things and we'll learn more about that as we go. The next step for me, I always want to try to get as much science in, as much measurement into a project as I can. So along this whole project, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little acoustics segment, hopefully in or probably in every video, certainly every video that involves changes to the interior of the van and maybe some of the videos that involve changes to the exterior of the van. If we install a fan someplace, we're going to want to know how that changes the acoustics. Now, I don't have super delicate, precise acoustics measurement equipment, and I'm not set up to do that really anyway, but what I do have is my phone, and I've installed a decibel meter app that will record and measure sound levels in the van using the hardware that is the phone, using the mounting techniques that I employ. The trick here is to make sure that I do it the same way every time. So if my app tells me I'm at 80 decibels and a laboratory system told us we were at 83, it really wouldn't be that big of a deal because what we're looking for is we're looking for the changes. So today is gonna to be kind of our baseline, noisiest possible van experiment. And we're going to measure that, and I'm going to measure it across a couple of different surfaces. I'm going to measure it in a city street, just like downtown here in the hood. I'm going to measure it on a rural street or a quiet neighborhood street, and I'm going to measure it on the highway. And let's see what the ambient sound level is in the van when we drive in those areas. And we'll measure it that way every time. I'll start a spreadsheet and I'll log this, and let's see what we can do to reduce the noise levels in the van. So this is the acoustics part of the adventure and we're going to get started with it right now. I've got my uh, little magic arm thing I'm going to do and what I'm going to do is just like mount this right here. I'm going to spool up my little dB meter which you can see right now says that we're at about whatever that sound level is. And then if I this magnet here is locked to the ceiling of the van. So the sound is going to transmit through the van, through this magnet, through this arm, through this uh, 
mount for the iPhone through the iPhone, and that's gonna be an artificial measurement of what the sound level is in the van. But if I hook it to the same place every time, and if I use this same hardware every time, again, we're gonna get a consistent, even if it's a little bit inaccurate measurement. What we want is we wanna see the sound levels in the van to go down as we do our adventure. Now, one of the cool things about this app is I'm also able to record what happens. Huh? Okay, let's drive. So that's going to wrap it up for what let's call part one of this video. If you want to know when the next video comes up, you can click the subscribe button and click the little bell button. And if you like the video, you can click that too, but I'll let you know when part two happens. In part two, we're going to actually install the subfloor and keep on keeping on. In the meantime, thank you for helping me bring physics family and fun to kids everywhere. I'm Will Pemble, and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.